I am a soft matter experimentalist at University of Massachusetts in the physics department. A little bit about myself. I am born and raised in Hyderabad. I went to Jawaharlal Nehru University to do my master's in physics. Then I moved to Bangalore, where I got my PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, or JNCSR. After which, I went to South Korea, have done a postdoc for a few years, and then I got an opportunity to start my own research lab as an assistant professor in the Department of Physics at University of Massachusetts. Now, I'm there starting my own group, and there are a lot of things our group is interested in. But today I'm going to share with you one topic which I got really interested in during my PhD and I'm actually still continuing to do research in that subject, which is what you see here, glass. Yes, I mean the window pane glass. Uh, so I'm going to tell you what uh, we know about glasses, what we don't know, and why scientists and engineers should care and try to understand glasses or as why there is such an extensive research on this extensively used materials. At this point, some of you might be wondering, glass of physics, what is she talking about? So hold on. In the next 10 minutes, my agenda is to convince you and or to show you how fascinating this material is from a science and an engineering point of view and even for an experimentalist like me who likes to see inside the materials and understand their behavior. So before I move into the topic, let me ask you one simple question. What comes to your mind when you think of a glass? Uh, for me, I think of like say Coke bottles, which used to be made of glass when I was young, or some decorative, beautiful decorative items like wall hangings and chandeliers and so on. And if you wear glasses like me, then you will think of this glass, right? So all of us think of different things when we think of glass. And if some of us are more curious, then we'll ask, what is are all of these made of? Or you can ask, okay, the same material, how can it take so different forms? Or what are the mechanical properties? Can I change from one to other? How do I play with this material? Or can I look inside this? and understand how it's made and what its properties are. If any of you have asked these questions before, when you looked at these materials or any others, then kudos to all of you. You're already thinking like scientists. This is because these are exactly the questions scientists ask, right? When we try to understand about anything in more detail. So leaving this apart, I'm gonna go on and tell you a more, bit more scientific details about this interesting material, glass. So let's begin by looking at how a glass is formed. So there's gonna be a phase diagram where you see things change from a high temperature to a low temperature, that is cooling a liquid, right? So when you take a liquid and you reduce the temperature, so basically follow one of these blue lines, but reduce the temperature really fast, what happens is this liquid increases the density and goes up into forming these materials or glasses in general. Now, if you take similar liquids and do a very slow cooling and then bring to a lower temperature very, very slowly, beyond a certain temperature, the material starts to organize and start forming these beautiful crystal structures. Now, these starting materials might look very similar in terms of their physical properties, but depending on how fast or how slow you reduce the temperature, they can go to a glass or they can go to a crystal. And in fact, this is something we do almost every day. Like we freeze, right? We freeze water to get ice. That's basically most of the ice we observe in our everyday life is mostly crystalline. In fact, there is a current ongoing research about making amorphous ice. So let's not go into the details about that. But basically the interesting thing is a liquid why are these intermediate super cool liquid goes into a glass if you cool it very, very quickly. This is the way glasses are formed. Now, at low temperatures, if you just see this part, you have two kinds of solids. What's the difference? If we look at inside, say if we are able to see atoms and molecules, what do we observe? Let's see what we may see if we actually look into this. Let's look at cartoons of them. So, 
we'll just revise the states of matter. So we know liquid. So in a liquid, if we assume each of these as an atom or a molecule or a particle, whatever you want, and you can find them in a tiny volume or an area, so they are sparsely separated. So there are fewer atoms and molecules which are moving around in a fixed volume. This is how typically liquids look like. Now, if you think of similar molecular arrangement and ask, what does it look for like a solid? It could be an amorphous solid or it could be a crystalline solid. Now, if it is an amorphous solid, you have a large density, which is common in both. But for an amorphous solid, there is no order which is very visible or which is very evident. So there is a large density, but no obvious structures or obvious orders. On the other hand, in a crystal, you always typically end up finding an obvious structure and an order. This is an example which shows square lattice. They could be square, they could be hexagonal. There are a large number of crystal structures. But you can't really define a structure very easily in an amorphous solid. This is actually what makes these materials really interesting. Because when you look at the arrangement, it's like liquid. They don't have a structure. But if you look at the properties, they're like solid. What's this material, right? Now, that's when actually the dynamics or how molecules or atoms move inside this become very important. If you take a liquid, uh, let's use the word relaxation time in a way to uh, understand the motion, okay? So relaxation time naively is the time taken for an object to move around its own distance or what's the time taken for an object to be altered by its neighbors. Let's simply put it that way. Now this is a plot which shows, let's not worry about the complicated past. Basically this shows us as you go to higher and higher temperatures, the relaxation time <coughs> freezes, right? So let's look at this. At melting temperature, which is when it's close to the liquid, the relaxation time is very small, which means the atoms and molecules can do very fast motion. But now, when you slightly decrease the temperature, which means it's going close to the glass, the relaxation time increases rapidly. In fact, this is what makes the glass even more interesting. So you have an arrangement of molecules, which naively looks like liquid, which, which means that there is no structure. But if you look at the time which takes for the particles to move around, it's really, really large. And this is what one of the features which gives rise these glassy materials, these amazing solid-like properties. So there has been a large amount of research understanding how this happens, why this happens, and so on and so forth. One thing as an experimentalist I'm interested in is, of course, how do I study them experimentally? There could be multiple ways to do it, but I want to look at them, right? And it's really difficult to see atoms. They're too small and they're too fast, which means I can't capture videos very easily. So the question remains, how do I look at them when they are moving? So a lot of soft matter researchers or scientists like me use these systems, which are models, which are called as colloidal systems. So actually colloids are not nothing new, you know, we pretty much use them every day. For instance, milk is a colloidal suspension. It fat globules suspended in water, but we don't use milk for our studies. What we use is we make, we tailor make the particles we need such that they are of the sizes we want and so on and so forth. So we use these colloids, which let's call for the purposes of this talk, big atoms. So we use these colloids, which move around in liquid, in water, like atoms, which are much larger than atoms, and they can form crystals, liquid, glasses, and so on. But the whole advantage is they are easy to see and easy to follow. So we can use simple microscopes, like tabletop microscopes, and image colloidal particles. For instance, each of these bright spots you see around is a one micron colloidal particle, which is jiggling around in water. So this is in some sense a liquid because you have few particles which are moving around in the liquid. Now we use these systems, but you remember for it to go from a liquid to a glass, it needs to increase the density. So we do increase that. Now this is a system or an example of an image where we increase the density. So just to make a glass, we basically use two kinds of particles, like the bigger ones are two microns, smaller one is one. This is just a minute detail. 
But the important point is now we can see and we can follow, right? Which means oh, uh, we can actually do some nice interesting glass physics. But for the purposes of this, I'm not going to show complicated graphs or analysis. I'm going to show you some simple visual representations because we can see them, right? So let's do that. So what we do is we take videos like this and we use computer programs to identify each and every particle. And then we follow each and every particle in time. So you can calculate the position and you can calculate the mobility. In fact, this is a map of all of these particles where they are color coded based on their mobility. So if it is red, this is one of a particle which moves fast. If it is blue, it moves very slow. Now, if you look at this video, you really can't say which parts move fast, which parts move slow, right? But now when I put this color code, you can immediately see that there are some parts which move faster and there are some parts which move slower. That's surprising. So this has, this clearly shows that though the structure looks uniform and homogeneous, the motion is actually not uniform. So the motion or the movement is actually heterogeneous in this homogeneous looking material. So this has actually been a prediction in glass literature for a long time. And a colloid experiment like this can actually nicely show you these visual representation with a background of computer uh, programs and particle tracking and so on. So this is one such nice clue. Now let's look at deeper inside this image. So even in this image, if you look at one of these regions, which has a fast moving particles, what one can actually figure out is that they are not moving randomly. In fact, there is all the fast moving particles actually move together. So the way they move is one guy pushes the guy in front of it and then that pushes the other one next to it. So what we have in a glass, a glassy or an amorphous material is so-called cooperative region or cooperatively moving regions. So these two images together, I hope have given you um, an idea of what kind of insights we can get into this glass by being able to quantify the motion of each and every particle. So a lot of these, a lot of such puzzles have been there and using the systems like this, we can understand the microscopic insights. In fact, all these together is what gives rise glass their amazing mechanical properties and utilities. So over the last few slides, I basically told you how we can actually get microscopic insights into these regularly used glassy materials. How, so though they don't have any visible structure, how interesting the mobility inside them is. And I've only just, just given you a flavor. In fact, using these systems, we can actually ask so many questions. How does a glass crack? How does a crack propagate? Or what happens to a glass when I pull? How do these little, little atoms and molecules or colloids move when I pull glass? Or you can ask a more physics question, or which is, is it a phase transition? If it is a phase transition, it's a first order phase transition or a second order phase transition. How do I quantify this? So there are a lot of questions we can ask. So this is from a glass point, right? Now, I also showed you examples of colloids. So using colloids, I showed you how we can study glasses. But in fact, we can study a lot many other systems. We can study crystals, we can study liquids. We can make them so we can actually design a lot of new materials, which means this also opens up an entirely different field of science. So combining colloids and an important and a very useful material glass, I've shown you how we can use to understand um, from a microscopic perspective, these interesting glassy materials. So with this, I want to thank all my advisors for motivating me or for introducing me to this colloids and glass and soft matter. And I thank you all for your attention. And this is my email and web page. If you want to check out more on what do I do? And if you're interested and want to talk more, please drop an email. Thank you.